मुझे लगता था ये सवाल का जवाब देना कि ये पर रसौली का क्या होगा रसौली का जो है ना रसौली तो थिंक अबाउट द फाइव वर्ड्स दे यू हैव टू चेंज द होल पिक्चर इन योर अकाउंट सो आई जस्ट आई हैव मैनेज दैट इट्स अ चैलेंजिंग सिचुएशन इन हाउस टू प्रेजेंट विद इट फैसिलिटी एंड हैव गॉट सम एसिम्टोमेटिक और इवन सिम्टोमेटिक मायोमास I try to just go through how common are they, what mechanism um, is there which affects fertility in patients with fibroid, what should be the aim of management, we'll discuss a bit about the treatment and um, if time allows, then I'll do just some short case discussions. So approximately 5 to 10% of women with infertility have fibroids. But if you take all the other factors into account, we are usually left with pure subfertility and fibroid incidence is around two percent. Uh, there are lots of plausible mechanisms, but the distorting effect on endometrium inhibiting implantation stays as the leading cause of infertility in women with fibroid. The other mechanisms like the spermatozoa, motility. Um, entry to the cervix and creation of hyperestrogenic environment, they are all plausible causes. <coughs> so when we come across a patient who we want to manage for fibroid, I think there are three things that we need to consider. You need to see, you need to evaluate these fibroid and classify them and we go into a bit of detail about that. I'd like to uh, see what is the likelihood of this fibroid affecting their fertility. And please, please, please always consider other factors, especially maternal age, duration of infertility, and ovarian reserve. Three most important factors before you give, uh, try and give them any options for infertility management. So, what does evaluate mean? We evaluate for location. So, where are they located? Degree of invasion of the endometrial cavity and fibroid size and number. Uh, there is very less evidence of fibroid size and number affecting fertility, but reproductive success does, however, seem to be related to location. So I'll first discuss the location. Location is classified for fibroids, and the European Society of Hystroscopy has agreed on the classification as submucus, which distorts the uterine cavity, intramural, that is in the muscle of the in the myometrium but is not distorting the cavity and most likely less than 50% protruding into serosa. The ones which are protruding more than 50% are the sessile pedunculated subserosal fibroid. We need to uh, just, um, I would like you to just remember from this slide the submucosal uh, fibroids which are type 0, 1 and 2 and uh, type 0 is this which is the whole of the fibroid is in the cavity and the pedicle is usually small. Type 1, where the 50% comes inside and 50% uh, is in intramural and then type 2, which is more than 50% is intramural and slightly distorting the cavity. I think some local fibroids, uh, some local fibroids are the most relevant, so it is important to remember that. You will also come across the FIGO classification of fibroids. So once the patient has come and she's got some fibroids, we, how do we evaluate that? How do we classify them? Um, because usually when they come to us in the center, they have been investigated initially and they do come with hysterosalpingogram often. However, hysterosalpingogram is uh, uh, not very sensitive to evaluate and classify fibroid and the study says that there is about a 50% chance of HSG missing a submucosal fibroid. So I know this is very commonly performed uh, procedure, HSG characters the patients are in there, but that does not mean that the submucosal fibroid has been ruled out. For hai. The most uh, useful combination and the modalities of choice are transvaginal ultrasound scan and hysteroscopy. MRI, of course, you can argue. MRI is actually the most reliable method of evaluation. It has got a 100% sensitivity and 91% specificity. However, the main drawback is the lack of accessibility and high cost of MRI. 
Ultrasound, the transvaginal in the comparison, it's a rapid, safe, cost-effective. Many gynecologists perform them themselves as well. Uh, you have to look at the size, number, and location of fibroids. And my radiologists know that most of the time when there's a patient with the fibroid, I do come to the scan room and stand with them to see where these fibroids are located actually. TVS is very good, even they can identify up to 4 to 5 millimeter of fibroids. However, when there are multiple fibroids um, and uh, there is a lot of acoustic shadowing, and that's when we sometimes find it a bit difficult, but that's why maybe where MRI or a hysteroscopy comes into a role. So, once you have established where these fibroids are, then your life becomes easy. Because you know that the subserosal fibroids, they do not affect fertility and you cannot ignore them. The submucosal fibroids, they do affect conception, clinical pregnancy rate and live birth rates. And they need to be looked into in detail and you need to manage them before offering them any fertility management. And intramural fibroids, the role remain uncertain and they have an impact when the endometrium is involved. And I'll discuss about the in the management and how to manage these. So there are not many studies which, affect, which tell us about the size, uh, fibroid size and its impact on infertility. Um, there is a one study by Bulletti and Joel which says that the intramural fibroids more than 5 cm myometomy before IVF has been shown to positively impact pregnancy outcome. But as you all, that's all the evidence we have got. So you hear some people saying that if it's more than 4 cm, do consider myometomy. But uh, when we come to the management, I'll discuss that. So coming to the treatment, um, there is surgical and medical, and obviously, um, is, let's see what the medical management. There is no role for medical therapy for fibroids in infertile population. And uh, the current medical therapy that we usually use is uh, usually it suppresses ovulation, reduces estrogen, um, and it is a potential to interfere in endometrial development and implantation. So medical management has so far no role in patients with uh, fibroids who want to go for fertility treatment. Newer, newer therapies like aromatase inhibitors, methiprestone, and serms, they have shown some promise in symptom improvement and fibroid regression with the, without the hypoestrogenic symptoms. However, there is still no proven benefit in infertility treatment. But surely they have a role in patients who are uh, seeking treatment for other symptoms like heavy menstrual bleeding or mass effect. GNRH analogs, fairly commonly used, may be used currently of in clinical practice, may, uh, but they have no role in infertility with fibroids. Uh, Olipristol acetate, it uh, is a selective progesterone receptor modulator and uh, it has been associated with, it's like with Buran of Somalia with its liver side effects and it was banned in UK for some time. It has started uh, again in practice. Um, it's the Acha symptom effect here of fibroids, uh, but because infertility management makes a whole role in it. Let's come to the surgical management. And again, the well designed surgical intervention trials are very few. Meta analysis, so this is one meta analysis, which demonstrated that improvement in pregnancy rates in infertile patients are doing surgical removal of submucous fibroids, but not an intramural. Potential benefits of myomectomy you have to think about the detrimental effects. You try integrity, kakyamuga, adhesion formation. Other operative mobility. Myomectomy in infertile patients may be undertaken for reasons other than fertility. Ha, other fertility may have heavy menstrual bleeding, hai, mass effect hai. So then you have to think. You have to think that fibroids is such a heterogeneous disorder. So from a very small size to large fibroids which are palpable abdominally, you have to variation they can have ka. So one rule cannot apply all. So you have to think of all these things. Uh, the Royal College of uh, the Australian and New Zealand Royal College have some indications which are the same thing that is again different ways to say that infertile women with some fibroids, infertile women with symptomatic fibroids 
although trial evidence does not show clear benefits, and couple presenting with multiple pain cycles of ART, where female partners then had intramural fibroid. Compared to this, I really like the Canadian guideline because they have a little bit more elaborated on it. So, all the mucus fibroids, which we have removed, when we have located it, we know that they impact fertility and they keep it free of assessment, size, location, degree of invasion and try and manage them hysteroscopically. We know that subserosal do not need any treatment and can be managed conservatively. It's the intramural fibroids that present a dilemma and it's a very individualized management because you can consider malpectomy for a cavity distorted fibroid or fibroid more than 5 cm. However, there is quite fair evidence to recommend against myomectomy if there is a hysteroscopically confirmed impact evolution. So, if there is otherwise unexplained infertility, hai, cavity is okay, hai, but fibroid bade bhi hai, sometimes we can ignore that in our fertility practice. So, hysteroscopic myomectomy, unfortunately, not very commonly performed in Pakistan. There are centers, there are people who are and I do wish that one of these things is hysteroscopy, which I want to be aware of, which I want to be aware of, that it is very common to be such a simple procedure. And hysteroscopic myomectomy is so, so beneficial to the patient compared to laparotomy. Yeah, basically, it is very beneficial to the patient for all mucus. So, type 0 is the most effective technique. Type 1, yes, again. Type 2 is a bit difficult and often need double procedures. You have to think about the complication like intra-uterine adhesions and people do use uh, therapies like estrogen, insertion of IUCD or police catheter, but there is little evidence behind that. Abdominal myomectomy, commonly performed, I told all of you sitting here. This is a familiar procedure, symptomatic, with failed medical management, more than 5 cm. And um, laparoscopic or laparotomy, don't get worried. Because it's similar to the results, but obviously laparoscopy has quicker recovery. And it should be very individualized management depending on the size and location of fibroids. Again, we all know that anterior incision minimizes the formation of postoperative incision. New methods, uterine artery embolization, again being offered in Lahore in two centers as far as I know. So, uterine artery embolization is a good method for small fibroids, but it's the main concern I find is that when embolization is there, loss of ovarian reserve is there because the blood supply gets affected. So, in fertility, there is no role in it. Again, magnetic resonance guiding focused ultrasound surgery needs more studies to determine its role in women with infertility. So, if I manage to put you to sleep, you know, this presentation may. So, this is the only thing that I wanted to take home today. I've summarized it that subserosal fibroid removal is not usually recommended. Some mucus fibroid should be improved to improve conception and pregnancy rate and don't be shy to refer to someone who can do that if you think that this will benefit the patient. Intramural fibroids in patients with hysteroscopically confirmed intact endometrium and otherwise unexplained infertility, benefit of myomectomy should be weighed against the risk. So I hope that this slide is the patient that you have asked that what will happen to Rasoli you will be able to answer. Because if it is all serosal, then Rasoli will ask you to ask if it is all serosal, then you will have to remove it. And if it is all intramural, then you will see all factors that it is all about its age, how the duration of infertility is, how the ovarian reserve is, will she benefit from this myomectomy or would you rather treat her initially for some fertility treatment and then consider myomectomy if the IVF or other fertility treatments pay. So this is the only thing that I want you to take home today. Treatment is individualized, myomectomy is the gold standard and the future research lies with intramural fibroids which we have to think. I will quickly go through these case discussions and this take it's very easy to present in front of you that this is a presentation, this is a guideline. 
But when you have to put that in practice, there are lots of other factors that come into, um, uh, you know, they, they, come, they come into role and they play a role. So what I've done is just three of our cases, confidentiality, uh, confidentiality clear, you know, just, I haven't put the names, but they're real cases. So 35 years old the, uh, lady with the Nelly Paris Nausa Hoge Shadi coach is a regular menstrual cycle and she comes for IVF to our clinic because of square oligospermia. HSG Wawak had three years ago, she had a regular cavity plating tube and her T waves showed um, intramural fibroids which were less than around 4 cm but according to the sonologist not uh, touching the endometrium and they were further away. So just think for how we proceed. So what I did, we offered hysteroscopy, but remember they real life hair, so patient her jara par harche ka sojta hai. So agar wo IV karwane aaya hai, that's an expensive treatment, and if you then offer something on top of it, they're not very keen to proceed. But she refused, those were away, so we agreed and we proceeded. She fortunately had a successful outcome with an ongoing joint pregnancy. Second case that I have put from our center is a 32 year old lady married for 8 years. She had a history of her miscarriage followed by an ectopic for which she had a laparotomy and then she had a laparoscopy which showed that the other tube has gone as well uh, and she had multiple subserosal and intramural fibroids. She wanted to go for IVF because of tubal factor. She had uh, she had the fibroid, the largest one is 6 cm, so more than 5 cm, they're too intramural, they were away from endometrium. So, I just got a fairly okay ovarian reserve. This patient, we did not check the cavity hysteroscopically, she went for IV or tubal blockade. Um, and she had a negative pregnancy test, but interestingly, this doesn't happen often. But during the treatment, because it's all hormonal, the fibroid size increased to that was the one which was 6 cm to 8 cm, started having some degenerative changes, it was pain to the patient. Um, we did conservative management and it settled. She still has frozen embryos, fortunately. <laughs> and we are thinking that what to offer her before going for a frozen embryo transfer. So maybe a big cavity check is something that we may offer. Um, because and we will uh, follow her up in 3 months to see the size of fibroids again. Case 3 is a lady who was married for 7 years with a history of laparotomy for ectopic when she uh, was then diagnosed with grade 4 endometriosis um, and she had a cystectomy. She has said, for, you know, this is this Dr. Shamila Nyanko Badaya, that endometriosis is a very strange disease. Hai. It's probably a whole girl patient for what pain would be a grade 4 endometriosis, tha, but she was uh, asymptomatic. She had a failed IVF in past, her current FSH 8 and the AM which is 0.6. So, unke bhi intramural fibroid hai, but all away from endometrium on ultrasound scan. Because she had grade 4 endometriosis, she was initially offered GnRH and Alok for 4 months to suppress the disease for endometriosis. She then had a hysteroscopy for cavity check. She was found to have two polyps. She had a smooth cavity after polypectomy and then you were compliant patients who are carrying evidence based on some months. She is one of those. She ended up having a positive pregnancy, but unfortunately had a miscarriage at five weeks. And I don't think they have got any frozen embryos for her as well, unfortunately. So I've just put these um, cases for you to see. It's not only the guy life, but it's putting everything together that helps us in managing these patients. Thank you very much for your appointment. Call us on plus 92 320 22 73 074.